you know, I, I read Kafka as one does in, in my teens and early 20s, perhaps not entirely as one does, because I think looking back on it now, I read Kafka as somebody who wanted to write fiction himself. So I tended to read him rather schematically and to read him as a pattern book for certain specific ideas that a fiction writer looks for. How do you get people to suspend disbelief in the fantastical? How do you sustain fantastical narrative? How do you create credible mise-en-scene within the context of the fantastical? Uh, you know, so a lot of, uh, of the reading I think that tyro fiction writers tend to do is not quite the kind of reading that people who certainly are translators and certainly are critical thinkers try to do. So my acquaintance with Kafka is from a, a different direction. So when I was um, reading Metamorphosis and other stories in the Hoffman translation, I read A Country Doctor. And some, that went in somewhere. And then I was reading a book by uh, the critic who sadly died recently, Paul Fussell, uh, The Great War and Modern Memory. Uh, and Fussell's thesis, for those of you not familiar with it, is that uh, the first few months of the First World War were a sort of machine for the production of irony a machine for the production of dramatic irony, the juxtaposition between the great powers going off to war, uh, essentially in a 19th century mode with conceptions of valor and honor, with flags and flashing cuirasses and horses, and the hell of static warfare on the Western Front and rather more mobile warfare on the Eastern Fronts and the Italian Fronts. But nonetheless, all of these fronts being turning into sort of production lines of death, you know, uh, was a, a tremendous moment of ironizing in Western civilization. I, I found Fussell's idea quite compelling. And one of the examples he uses of the way that that irony then rippled out through literature is actually from Joseph Heller's Catch-22 and relates to, if you like, the signature and epiphanic moment that turns the protagonist Usarian against war in Catch-22 when he discovers this young tail gunner, Snowden, who seems to have a wound on the front of his uh, body, and the Assyrian attempts to kind of deal with this wound and to kind of treat it, but the young man still continues to whimper and say, I'm cold, I'm cold, and Yusarian then realizes he's bleeding from his armpit. This young man undoes his flat jacket, and it turns out that he has been disemboweled by shrapnel from behind, and that, in fact, the wound on the front of his body is the exit wound. And that recalled, to my mind, the wound in Kafka's A Country Doctor, which was written in the winter of 1916-17. Now, as you may be familiar, many a cursory look at Kafka suggests that there's a notorious comment about him damning all the combatants of both sides to oblivion. Uh, there's a, one of the things that I suppose seals the ethereal reputation of Kafka's writing, certainly from the period 1914-18, is the complete lack of a mention of the First World War or any seeming registration of the impact of the First World War on Kafka's work. So the wound in A Country Doctor, which was written in the winter of 1916-17, and Fussell's theory of irony, and the wound in Heller's Catch-22 came together in my mind, and it occurred to me, was in fact Kafka registering in some sense uh, the impact, both lit literal and metaphorical, uh, of the First War, uh, and is it in some sense present in A Country Doctor? So that's the, the material I wanted to deal with. As a um, miserable, I, and incidentally I may say that in the process of, of writing this introduction to Hoffman's translation and reading I think his very fine introductory essay in that translation, uh, I swore off writing about writers who write in, in languages that I don't read. I actually thought in the process of writing that piece that uh, in all honesty I should stop writing about Borges or Kafka or uh, Zabelt, who we have a very respected translator of here, and that really it was time to shut up on the subject because I, uh, you know, 
I started to seriously work on my French a few years ago, and the more I worked on it and the worse I became at it, the more I became <laughs> conscious of the yawning gulf between my perception of writers in translation and what was going on with writers in their own language. So uh, one of the, that's to give you a little bit of the background to all of this, and I thought Perhaps the most uh, interesting or, or the, the, uh, the point to get inside the discussion and to, to start examining some of these questions in detail about the difficulties involved in translating at all, translating from the German and specifically translating Kafka uh, would be to read this passage, this description uh, of the wound. And uh, I'm going to, from, a, from Kafka's A Country Doctor, I'm going to read it in uh, Joyce Crick's recent translation for uh, Oxford uh, World's Classics. And then uh, Karen Siaga is very kindly going to read it in the German original. And as I say, there are sheets distributed around. If you want to have a look, I'm afraid there's not perhaps quite enough for all of you, but maybe you'll be generous or maybe you'll become curiously and unsuspectingly intimate with one another in the process of trying to crane over necks and shoulders. Uh, and that would be a way into the subject for us. I'm then going to ask a few questions, having got these very distinguished people, translators here of them, and then we very much want to throw the discussion open because I'm aware that there are professional translators here, students of translation, people who are interested in German literature, uh, and I'm sure you've all got very interesting things to say. And regard me as a sort of um, suitably... Uh, Czech or Prague-like golem of stupidness uh, that can be animated by your insights because it's a selfish exercise, frankly. I need to be told. Um, so here we go. Here, translated by Joyce Crick, is an extract from A Country Doctor by Franz Kafka. In his right side, in the region of the hips, a wound as large as the palm of my hand has opened. Rose red in many shades, dark in the depths, growing light towards the margins, delicately crusted, the blood welling intermittently, wide as an open cast mine. That is how it looked from a distance. Close up, it shows further worsening. Who can look at it without whistling softly? Worms, as thick and long as my little finger, colored rose from their own blood, but also bespattered, caught fast in the heart of the wound, with little white heads and many little legs writhe towards the light. Poor boy. There is nothing to be done for you. I have discovered your great wound. You will be destroyed by this bloom in your side. The family is happy. They can see me at work. The sister tells the mother. The mother tells the father. The father tells some guests who come tiptoeing in through the moonlight from the open door, balancing with outstretched arms. Will you save me, whispers the boy through his sobs, quite dazzled by the life in his wound. That's what the people in my region are like, always demanding the impossible of their doctor. They have lost their old faith. The priest sits at home and picks his cassocks into shreds one by one. But the physician is supposed to do everything with his delicate surgical hand. In seiner rechten Seite, in der Hüftengegend, hat sich eine handtellergroße Wunde aufgetan. Rosa, in vielen Schattierungen. Dunkel in der Tiefe, hell werdend zu den Rändern, zartkörnig, mit ungleichmäßig sich aufsammelndem Blut, offen wie ein Bergwerk obertags. So aus der Entfernung. In der Nähe zeigt sich noch eine Erschwerung. 
Wer kann das ansehen, ohne leise zu pfeifen? Würmer, an Stärke und Länge meinem kleinen Finger gleich, rosig aus eigenem und außerdem Blut bespritzt, winden sich, im Innern der Wunde festgehalten, mit weißen Köpfchen, mit vielen Beinchen ans Licht. Armer Junge, dir ist nicht zu helfen. Ich habe deine große Wunde aufgefunden. An dieser Blume in deiner Seite gehst du zugrunde. Die Familie ist glücklich. Sie sieht mich in Tätigkeit. Die Schwester sagt der Mutter, die Mutter dem Vater, der Vater einigen Gästen, die auf den Fußspitzen mit ausgestreckten Armen balancierend durch den Mondschein der offenen Tür hereinkommen. Wirst du mich retten, flüstert schluchzend der Junge, ganz geblendet durch das Leben in seiner Wunde. So sind die Leute in meiner Gegend. Immer das Unmögliche vom Arzt verlangen. Den alten Glauben haben sie verloren. Der Pfarrer sitzt zu Hause und zerzupft die Messgewinde, eins nach dem anderen. Aber der Arzt soll alles leisten mit seiner zarten chirurgischen Hand. Thank you. Now, could you do it again, please? <laughs> um, thank you very much. I wondered whether I could just ask the panel uh, a very, for a very kind of preliminary snapshot of their conception of what translation is in general. Um, somewhat inevitably, I was reading Walter Benjamin's uh, essay on translation uh, in the last few weeks. And he has this very arrest, arresting image uh, of the translator. He says that the, the, the writer or the artist is in the middle of the wood, listening to all of the sounds of the wood. But the translator is at the edge of the wood, shouting into it and listening for the sound of the echo. And I wondered whether that idea resonates with you and whether it speaks to you of what the task of the translator is. Maybe I could come to Joyce first. I was afraid you were going to mention ben Benjamin. <laughs> uh, well, this is something we were talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, Benjamin has resort to um, a metaphor at the end. And, well, we know Kafka had enormous trouble with the metaphors. He couldn't bear them. Uh, and I suppose we are the echo. Uh, we can give back the sound, but we're going to give back the sound with some distortion. We can't avoid that because the match between the two languages, syntactically, uh, as far as Lexis is concerned, neither uh, will exactly fit. Or if it does happen, it's a very, very rare and happy accident. Uh, so um, the distortion will be there. Uh, and I think you're aware of this before you ever start. Uh, because we'll reach for Ceylon's metaphor now, we'll talk in terms of a filter. Uh, we'll talk in terms of a grid that will at least let something through. It keeps an awful lot back, but something is coming through. And that something is a kind of residue that has at least stimulated you to think in terms of the First World War and the great wound that that struck. I'm not sure that uh, I would agree with you. It sounds pretty associative to me, but OK, that's another question for later. Um, so we know before we start, and with Kafka, I think, especially after we've finished, that we're not going to get it right. On the other hand, we will persist in doing it. Uh, there's something important about that, uh, that picture of the wound that uh, at some point has got through to you. And so somewhere along the line, the filter has worked. Uh, at least you've re reached a residue. And I think that's probably the best that we can hope. We will read as closely as we can. And I think you've got to be a good reader to translate. And 
we will let as much through as the English language and the resources and the constraints that it has and that our skills can offer. Um, but don't expect the real thing. Best I can. What do you think, Anthony? I mean, do you think, I mean, again, I'm, I'm using Benjamin because he just mm -hmm. it looms in this. He speaks in terms of the translator discovering a meta language in some way. And does that resonate with you, do you think? It, it does, and everything Joyce says resonates with me because there is going to be distortion. And I think one cannot describe the translation process without metaphor. And for me, the prime one is the translation is an illusion. We're illusionists. We're trying to create an illusion that the reader is hearing the author's voice. Well, there's going to be something of our voices in it, too. It is the distortion. I've got two windows in the room where I sit working at home, and one is obviously a pane of glass much older than the other, and it's got little interesting flaws in it. And the other is plain modern glass. And one would try to reflect everything exactly, but no, it will come through with the little distortions. Um, Edith Grossman, in her book, What is Translation For?, describes translation by many metaphors we can't do without it. I once tried to describe it without. It was in a discussion with um, the winner of the German Book Prize, a very uh, good Italian author, very fluent in English, and um, we were discussing the translation process, and I said I have tried to describe it without metaphor, in that the translator's mind briefly, after the reading that Joyce quite correctly mentions, there is one description of translation as a particularly intensive form of reading, which I go along with very much. Um, but um, there are many different metaphors, and I tried to say that the translator's mind dwells somewhere for a little while in a place where there isn't any language at all. And then with luck, comes down with an English draft. There's only the general idea in the mind. And the young Italian said to me, oh, yes, and where is this place you are talking about? And I'd only made another metaphor out of it. <laughs> but um, it is too true. There's nothing more enjoyable than to be asked to translate a book, either one that you have loved for ages, and it may be a new translation that's another can of worms, actually, new translations of books that have been translated before, or it may be a new one, and you are delighted to think you'll get a chance to have a go. But you will be disappointed with yourself. Edith, in her book, describes the very satisfying moment when sometimes, sometimes, the translator feels that he or she is on song and giving a reasonable version of uh, what the author was saying. Oh, and we are looking for the author's voice. I've heard Michael Frayn speak of the translator as an actor, and he's a man of the theater, he should know. Um, many, many metaphors. And one of mine is that it's like walking a tightrope because you've got a duty to the author, you've got a duty to the readers in the language of translation, and somehow you've got to keep your balance, which is not easy. But what, if you come off that tightrope, you've shattered the illusion. What you seem to be saying, or what you're, you, you seem to suggest, is that the place you go to is somewhere where, as a very close reader and an empathetic reader, you are in some sense hearing the writer's voice shorn of its contingent factors, including yes, exactly. its language. Yes, so yes. that would in some way connect with Benjamin's yes. concept yes. of the of the meta-language. And, and to give a version that is a convincing illusion, you've got to find the equivalence in your own language. Mm. So you're, you're, in a sense, uh, disengaging from the language in which it was written into a kind of Ursprach of some kind, or a kind of, uh, and then actually it's that that you're translating back into 
oh, oh, forward into English. Yes. And absolutely, way back when we were all doing our language A levels and so on, you had to make sure to echo every last little dock and knock of the German in a sentence so that the examiner would see you hadn't missed anything. But um, you can you can rephrase things. I'm perhaps rather a free translator. Mm. I don't know, but um, it's trying to find as close as possible a way to say what the author was saying in something like his voice. Mm. And we know it's hopeless. Mm. The, so the no reason why we shouldn't try. The <laughs> distinction <laughs> between the kind of informational content, translating the informational content, and as it were, translating the sense, is that a false dichotomy for you, Joyce, or is it a real one? I mean... It, it's usually the informational content that comes through. Mm. Um, and that's where you have the sense of the inadequacy. Uh, when you've got a fine writer like Kafka, where, where the informational content is so much carried by the style. Mm. And, uh, and by hearing the voice, and by the tone, and that's the tricky bit, and that's what does evaporate, I find. In your, you've got a very mm. good short note to your translation uh, of The Hunger mm. Artist and the other short fictions, uh, in which you say that, that in some <coughs> cases in Kafka, all you can get is the rhythm. Is yeah all you can take out is the rhythm into English in terms of voice and in terms of what he's doing mm. stylistically mm. You, you, to attempt more. Uh, and you mentioned some s specific problems uh, with Kafka. So if we could get a, go in through what you said into some more specific problems with Kafka. One you mentioned that's technical, and you could, I, I'd like you to explain this to me. It's probably absolutely old hat to everybody else in the room apart from me. But you mentioned in particular the subjunctive in Kafka and the, sub in the subjunctive in the particular kind of German he writes and how it's obsolete in English and how we tend to, it tends to be translated as, the, as a conditional in, in the wrong sort of sense. And I wondered if you could enlarge on that because that seems to me to cut to the core of, of, of some of these problems. Well, um, I don't think it comes up in this passage. No, it doesn't so we in this got, particular passage. Uh, it, it's uh, always easier to, to have something concrete to talk about. But in general, uh, Kafka's world is a, a speculative world. If you read sentence after sentence of his, it will begin with an if, or he will, I think he's very suspicious of how precise language can be, very doubtful of that, and so instead of comparing something, I said he didn't like metaphor, instead of comparing something specifically, he will say, it's as if. Mm. Uh, so again, there's something speculative there, and another trick, of course, which is built in, so many of his stories are simply told from the point of view of the protagonist, the narrator is the protagonist. So a kind of indirect speech is operating. Now these are all instances that are followed quite naturally in German uh, by the subjunctive, which is, it isn't obsolete in English, but it is falling out of use. Mm. And so the insecurity, the unsteadiness, the built-in skepticism of uh, the speech uh, tends to get resolved into the indicative of fact. I think that's the, the best I can say without mm. a, an example. Yeah. But the problem is also mm. surely that, that as mm. if and conditional phrases mm. are used for metaphors in, in English. Well, it's naturally. a kind of metaphor, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Well, it mm. often becomes collapsed into the mm. metaphoric. And I think yeah. you also say the problem is in translating it is you're in danger of making it too heavy. Yeah, that's uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. And presumably what you're also saying is that what we very much associate with the Kafkaesque, which is not simply the construction of, you know, bureaucracies of faceless people and the sense of the mm -hmm. poor, small individual and the oppressed world, but is actually a uh, surface to the prose style that suggests the uncanny in some way. 
that that is much lighter in the original German. It, it's more natural rather than It does unheimly. come easier to German grammar, mm. yeah, which it, it gets rather clunky then if you mm. turn it into uh, I mean, it, English. What I noticed, yeah. Yeah. coming back, for example, from more recent translations such as your own or Anthea's translation to mm. the Muirs, is how clunky their translation feels. Is that, uh, do you feel that way about some of the Muir's translations or? Well, I'm very fond of the Muir's, I must say. Uh, mm. um, and uh, I think, well, this may pick up An uh, Anthea's point about retranslating or translating late. They were the first to translate. And for, and they were tremendously excited about what it was they were translating. Uh, and starting off, you're introducing a translation of something very strange, very new, uh, uh, to an audience that is certainly going to be puzzled by it. You're going to possibly make it a little bit easy. Uh, you're going, the, the introductory, listen to this amazing writer, uh, impulse that you've all heard of, or most of you may have heard of them in, in, in the journals and so on, well, here he is. I think uh, that is almost the criterion one needs to judge a new translation mm. of something very new mm. on. Uh, and there, I think, they're enormously successful. I, I'm surprised you call them clunky. It may be a matter of it's a much older kind of prose. Well, that sort of brings me, maybe I'll, I'll direct this one to Anthea. This brings, in, I'm only using Benjamin as a yardstick for this because he lays a lot of this stuff out. And of course, he says the thing about uh, great works of literature is that they have to wait for their translators. And I think he thinks that because he thinks that you need the necessary period of time away from the work to understand what its own impact is in its native language and how yes. that native language has developed in a sense to find a trigonometric point in time from which to assay, you know, because he also says that, you know, the responsibility or the task of the translator is in a sense to record the after echo of the work in language as well. And I wondered what your kind of view on that is and at what point you want to translate a writer, whether it's more helpful to have some decades between you and them. Uh. If it's a writer who is worth retranslation, he or she will certainly have been translated before. Mm. And I, for one, never look at an early stage at um, a new translation I'm doing of a book already translated. When Joyce and I were both doing volumes in the new Penguin Freud, and the legal side of Penguin sent round warnings saying that the... Um, Estate, the Strachey Estate editions, they had lost their uh, license at Penguin to publish this, so they were doing, um, and the, the Strachey editions lawyers were going to look very closely at all our translations for fear of plagiarism. Well, my response was I'd never read my title except in German, mm. and I wasn't going to look at anything else until mm. the end. But people vary. Um, my friend Michael Henry Heim asked to do a new translation of Man's Death in Venice, read every single version there was of it before deciding if there was room mm -hmm. for another. So your Stanley inclination... So, did the same. Mm -hmm. But your inclination is never to read other translations. I, I'm afraid I would be influenced. <coughs> um, and it's very interesting in the end to go back and look. Now, I don't want to drag in too many authors other than Kafka, because this is a strictly Kafka thing. Mm. But I found recently doing a new translation of Stefan Zweig's one and only definitely full-length novel that he let out of his hands as such. It's called Beware of Pity in English, which is a long, long way from the German, which is Ungeduld des Herzens, Impatience of the Heart. Um, and the people at Pushkin Press, who had the rights to publish the old one and were publishing the new one, kept on saying to me, look, the... Uh, first translator said something different. And I said, I'm saying what the German text says. And I came to the conclusion that Zweig had been, he was so anxious for reasons of the imminent Second World War, 
because he had been so struck by the horrors of the First World War that you were mentioning. And he really wanted to get that book out. And he must have sent his translators bits of it in chunks, in just the same way as I translated Max Sebald's Austerlitz in chunks. And so the first translators never got to see the full version mm. with changes that the author must himself has made of, of, of dates, of names of hotels. Um, but but um, those, those are minor things. But yes, style, style does date. It's odd. Uh, the Folio Society once asked me to look through the Low Porter translation of Buddenbrooks and make about 50 small revisions. Well, I had to make more than that. Mm -hmm. um, they are notoriously inaccurate because man was so keen to have his books in English that apparently he turned a blind eye to the inaccuracies. But it was the style mainly. There's a passage where the girl, somebody's speaking of the little girl, Tony, then 11. This Tony was a dainty little maid. <laughs> that doesn't go down in modern English. We'd well, say a charming child or something like that, but what will they say in 50 years? Exactly. Time? So where would, mm. I was going to ask you about specifically that question and mm. say that possibly these problems are of not such a great plangency with Kafka's prose, which I imagine yeah. from, is, is relatively unidiomatic in that way. And it's, it's so much his own idiom, isn't it, George? Yes. Mm. That's, that's, that's As you were saying, yeah. there is this oddly uncanny supernatural effect to it. Mm. The scenes in Selma Wen in the castle. Frida suggests to the Lancer there, oh, we could go off and live in the south of France. It's a shock. You think, of course, my good girl, you can't possibly do it. Because you're, you're not in, in a realm a that is coextensive. Yes. And yes. In, presumably he uses remarkably few uh, temporally specific terms or, or things that... So, in a way, he's giving an open invitation to freer translation in that way. It would be very interesting to read all these, which I haven't done, I, I must know. say. But, um, well, hmm. Could I ask you, Anthea, about something else specific that, that is exhibited, certainly in a country doctor, mm -hmm. that I'm not quite sure in this passage, mm -hmm. and then maybe come to Joyce on it, which is tense. Yes. Mm. Kafka plays around with tense, yes. and it's difficult in English, yes. and, it's, and it's difficult, and it often seems... Um, I mean, some translators are reverent, it seems to me, to his tense shifts. Mm -hmm. uh, some are highly irreverent. Mm -hmm. So the question for both, what's going on with Kafka's tense shifts? How does it feel in German? Does it feel as odd in German as it might do in English to shift from the simple past to the historic present in the space of, a, of well, in two sentences. Not to me, because so many German and French authors indeed do it. Yes. But very unusual in English. Well, it, I think it's getting to be more acceptable now. I, I've several times recently said to editors at a publisher, look, the original has a shift between the simple past and um, the historic present. Um, and I'm happy to go along with this. You'd better read it and see if you think it's all right. The passages, there were passages in the Zweig novel, they were a case in point. Mm. Uh, when the young narrator, hopelessly mixed up, idealistic young man, um, gets all confused, he slips into the historic presence and it adds immediacy. Mm. I think you can only play it by the author and by ear. Yeah, I'm, I would agree there. Do you think that's something you've introduced, Joyce, you, as translators, by translating from languages in which it's more... I mean, it was acceptable to Kafka writing in the late teens and early 20s of the last mm -hmm. century to use that shift. Is, is it from you that it comes? I wonder. Um, well, we have our predecessors. It's probably happened before that. Um, well, the Muir's, for example. I do discover that uh, nowadays uh, novelists write in the historic present a tremendous <coughs> amount. Uh, it, it's really absolutely current and taken for granted, whereas I'll swear 10 years ago it wasn't. Mm. Um, it, there the effect is different, though. It is a sense of going into the dark and not knowing what's coming mm. next. And that, of course, is very Kafka. Yeah. You also mention in your... Um, I introduction uh, again about this this, this submerged uh, you know sort of narrative 
figure and the mm -hmm. disjunction between the thinking eye yeah. and what's going on there. In German, there's this, again, there's more naturalness to that distinction. It's almost, I mean, I can only think of it in terms of French, where you use va to indicate a very mm -hmm. near future. You say yeah. in Kafka, he's indicating a very near past. That's right, it is. Which uh, we don't have in English again, um, in quite the same way. It's not so much the tense he uses, it's all the little words of he had just finished mm. breakfast when they broke in and arrested mm. him. Mm. Uh, it's all these little words of get hard in. So it's expressed yes. adverbially it's rather expressed than adverbially. in tense. Yeah. And, yeah. and the other thing, of course, is, I mean, we've sort of touched on is the enormous number of qualifiers oh, that there are there. Yeah. Yes. Everything is almost, or some variation on almost. Mm. Um, and uh, again, uh, there's this built-in suspicion of uh, the security of the statement that he's writing down. If it's not precisely that, it's almost that. And, uh, and there are all sorts of qualifiers, you know, practically, praktisch, positively, and the vexed, uh, förmlich, literally. He, he uses that. Uh, Firmlich is what he uses, and it's a dreadful word. <laughs> Do you translate that as literally? I translate that as literally, and I know that's uh, really a bit of a challenge because it, it is a solicitor. Well, it's become a nonce word in contemporary yes. English. Yeah. So mm. people say literally when they mean figuratively, and figuratively when they mean literally. Yeah, well, that's what Kafka so does with Firmlich. <laughs> does he? Yes. Well, that's a disaster. I mean, the other thing that... Um, <laughs> no, it just means that what you're saying is deeply uncertain and please be suspicious of it. No, but it. what I mean is it's a disaster going back to the issue of periodicity. Mm -hmm. You know, you're dealing yeah. with something which now yeah. may sound mm. really kind of quite um, unpleasant and kind of a sort of the, the, and like a nonce word in yeah. contemporary English, and yet that's the sense of, of what he's saying is a problem. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask you, though, is... I think it's Milan Kundra in, in an essay on translating uh, remarks on, and I think his particular butt here is the Muir's, on a tendency to smooth out repetition uh, yes. and how important mm. repetition is mm. for Kafka. And we certainly see it in this, it's mm. notable in this passage, mm -hmm. uh, the use of, of red for the serving maid's name, yes. Rosa, and the use yeah. of the, the color of the blood. Mm. Yeah. Is there, are you reverent about reproducing Kafka's repetition? I am when I see the, see it, and I didn't see it, so, did I? <laughs> did no? it. But I did it, yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't think, well, maybe I did see it, I don't know. Um, it, uh, it depends. I think if you're reading Thomas Mann, who makes great play with repetition and variation in a thoroughly Wagnerian way, I as, think as you motive. have to watch out mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. the repetitions. Mm. Uh, with Kafka, it's more discreet. Mm. Uh, but yes, keep an eye open for that kind of thing, yeah. yeah. And then the question of, as it were, purity of German prose, which is a phrase, of course, that is absolutely meaningless to somebody who doesn't read German. <laughs> so whenever you read about descriptions of German writers, when, they're, when people write about their style, they will talk about purity of German prose. In Kafka's case, there's, you know, Goethe is bandied about as a model mm. for his prose. Uh, there is the influence of his particular Prague German uh, on the way that he writes German. Some people say that he writes a particular form. Uh, Hoffman, for example, says that he writes uh, a kind of universally understood demotic German of his period that is particularly lean probably because he comes from a more dialect background in terms of spoken German. What's your view on this? Oh, it's so difficult. I mean, I'm not, well. I'm not a native German. I'm not a native Prague speaker. Prague speakers, old people, old people, yeah, older than I, uh, that I've asked about this, literate old Prague speakers, have said no. No, it wasn't like that at all. We talked perfectly good German, very firmly. Uh, and uh, so, no, I know the, the whole descriptions of uh, Prager Deutsch and, and the input of uh, Czech and Yiddish. Uh, to, I, I really do not know. Mm. Uh, the best I can say is that he writes a 
beautiful German for his purposes. Mm. I'm not sure I would call it Goethean, um, but uh, I'd have difficulty, I think, in describing Goethe's prose. Well, maybe I could just ask mm. you briefly, mm. Anthony, and then maybe we should go to Karen on this one and see yes. what she yes. has to say. Mm. What, what do you think? I mean, a pure German, what does... What pure does... German, this is very difficult. Um, I'm sorry to go back to Max Say, but he's sometimes mm. been said to have written an old-fashioned kind of German. Absolutely, and had very but, defined earlier models. Very literary. Very, very literary, but it was mm. his own. And now the repetitions in him were very, very important. And he repeated things to convey a sense of melancholy, of vagueness, of the imminence of death and the other world and ghosts and so on. I've just been translating a very modern novel, completely, utterly different, which the author uses his repetitions for the sake of gentle irony. And it works very well. And I have written a note to the editor saying, do not let the copy editor follow the manual, which I'm sure says, strike out all repetitions, as you were mm. suggesting, because some authors use them for style, it is their own style. Mm, mm, mm. But the, I mean, the information content is as nothing mm. to trying to reproduce or get something even verging on style. And you were mentioning the subjunctive earlier, and this is a great loss to us in English. I don't yeah. think we ever used the subjunctive in indirect speech, but the Germans do it the whole time by simply putting all the verbs in the in the subjunctive, they can go on reported speech for long, long periods at a time. In English, after a little while, mm. you think, well, they'll have forgotten it's indirect speech by now, the readers will. At this point, we've got to put in a, he continued, she went on, or something like that, just to remind them. If only we had that use of the subjunctive. Yeah. Uh, also, because it removes, it creates a kind of um, side stream to the narrative, it doesn't does, it? In yeah. English, mm -hmm. to have that much yeah. indirect speech mm -hmm. would seem to be detaching from mm -hmm. the narrative at that point. Mm -hmm. And that's, that problem doesn't exist in German. Mm -hmm. but what do you think, Karen, about this question of Kafka's pure German? I think I'm of that generation which reacts quite problematically to the term pure German mm -hmm. because it's been a freighted term. used in quite different ways. Mm. Um, just Looking at Kafka and, and reading Kafka, I think, um, on the one hand, it is an incredibly uh, masterful way of using every single word that counts. Um, every single expression, every single word, every single syntactic construction, whether it is a normal construction or quite an unusual construction, um, com contributes to creating the meanings that, that you were talking about earlier. And then there's that shift to the dem demotic. Um, and uh, we, we've got a couple of examples in this mm -hmm. excerpt yeah, here. It just moves it? over, um, and you have that um, almost everyday speech, but it's not signposted um, very obviously. Just, it just sort of uh, that immediate transition, and then he moves back again to um, the more narrative um, style. And, and I think that is what strikes me as a reader most strongly in, in reading Kafka, that you always stumble across the way he uses words, the combinations of words, and the sentence constructions that he has. And they're all beautiful, but they're also often quite unusual and make you think. So can you give us one of the examples you picked up on in this um, passage? Yeah, and just give it to us in German, and then maybe we could look at what Joyce did with, did with it rather meanly. Um, one, one of the things that struck me in this particular passage was the use of the um, adjective zart, which occurs in the first uh, description of the, of the wound, uh, zart Körnig. Um, and it's a very, it's, um, it's delicate or, um, yeah, delicate. Um, and it's used in describing the wound, and it's quite an unusual word to use in that context. And then towards the end, when the doctor is talking about, uh, he's, he goes off on his slight rant, uh, where he's a bit unhappy about um, the situation. 
and he talks about um, all the things that are demanded of the, mm. of the doctor. It's the last line. In fact, it's the last uh, three words. Mit seiner zarten chirurgischen Hand, his del you've translated it as his delicate mm. uh, surgeon's so surgical hand. Johnson. Yeah. So Joyce has, has done the first adjecti um, um, adjectival, adjectivally, it said delicately. Mm. Yeah. And mm. then, whereas it seems to be a noun in the German at the top. Um, no, 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 they're, oh, both, they're both modifiers. OK. Um, but it's the, the, the Zart is, is quite an unusual collocation in that context. You wouldn't necessarily use it to describe a wound or a, a surgeon's hand. So okay. you, that sort of jumps out at, at In at German, yeah. but it doesn't in English, does it? Mm -hmm. It doesn't to me. Well, oh, it's curious. Uh, Karen raised this beforehand. Uh, uh, we were chatting about it beforehand. I couldn't remember. I, I was assuming I hadn't noticed and hadn't, you know, it was chancy whether I'd uh, noticed or not. It looked as if I did or got it right by luck. <laughs> or but, attention. But <laughs> or attention, yes. There's, there's no um, possible way of indicating what the resonance of the particular word I mean, why, I mean, in German, you're saying, Karen, that that stands out as a modifier in those contexts? It might help towards an interpretation. Uh, you know, one of the uh, readings of what does that wound mean mm. um, is possibly that uh, this is where the doctor is discovering his own wound. Mm. And if the surgeon's hand shares a characteristic with the wound itself, it might, it might, you know, reinforce that kind of reading. Mm. Okay. I Delicate think I think it's these kinds of um, um, strands that are, are established and allusions and repetitions of words, which are used with one particular situation or concept or idea or person, and then used almost for the opposite which establishes connections throughout the text. And uh, we don't have so much subjunctive in this text, or the yeah. as-ifs, yeah. or uh, very little explicit metaphor. But we have these, these oppositions of uh, uh, formal oppositions between the, the doctor and the patient, and, the, and Rosa the maid, and Rosa the wound, mm. um, and the maid's uh, wound on the cheek, mm. and the the, the boy's wound on the, on the side, and that wound is described as a, as a bloom, as a flower, and Rosa, of course, is a, is a, is a flower, Rose is a flower. So you, you have these sort of patterns going through. Yeah, no, I mean, I appreciate that, and forgive me if for belaboring the point, and I may be being stupid, but that's what I am, I said at the outset. I thought you were saying that the use of the, the expression delicately in relation to the surgeon's hand and in relation to the wound Mm -hmm. seemed a little bit strange in German, whereas I'm, I, what I'm saying is it doesn't seem strange to use that particular modifier in English. You might well say of a surgeon's hand that it is delicate, mm -hmm. and indeed you might well say of a, the shading of a wound that it was delicately shaded. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, to me, as a native no, English speaker, seem strange, strange as a modifier, no, no. and it wouldn't in German. No, no. Okay, fine, no. I've just got the wrong end yeah. of the stick. You also, I think, Karen had said, when we were discussing it before we started, you said something about, because I wanted to talk a little bit about humor, and I'm conscious of time, so I think if we could speak a little bit about humor. I mean, there's a lot more I wanted to ask you about, but there you go. Maybe it'll come up in the general discussion. Uh, and one of the things that is said repeatedly about Kafka, starting with Max Brod and moving on and on and on, time after time after time, is is humor. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, there are countless anecdotes recounted that they may all be the same initial scene of him reading the opening passages of uh, the trial and everybody falling about incontinently laughing. Uh, I find this utterly perplexing, yes. uh, uh, reading it in English. I am not satisfied by any of the examples that are offered to me. Uh, of Kafka's great wit. I can see a sort of certain mordant laughter in the dark that's occurring at the end of an extremely long, dark, and dank passageway. Uh, but I laugh out loud funny? I think not. Uh, 
<laughs> Karen immediately said that, well, you've actually missed off the last two lines uh, after the passage that's on these sheets that we've been discussing, and they're quite funny. So would you, um, <laughs> would you like to expatiate on that? And I'm sure everybody will start falling about. <laughs> I think that bit's funny. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, there's something funny in the, in the wound patch as well. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's rolling in the aisles funny, um, but it's that, it's that sense of the absurd, which um, is evident in the story throughout, uh, with all these sort of weird transitions and the, the horses coming out of the pigsty and then the, the horses putting their heads through the windows. So I find this absurd occurrence quite quite funny because it, it it's it's presented in such a deadpan straightforward way it's just there and then the horses sort of intervene with or speak to god or or, mm. or, or that's quite funny i find but then um the that that <laughs> i once i once discussed with english friends um jokes um, and the un their relation to the unconscious um, and we were reading it in English translation and all my friends were saying none of the jokes in, in <laughs> that Freud gives are funny and I said oh yeah they're very funny and explained nothing worked anyway so um, I think in the in the excerpt that we have here uh, that that move from the from the narrative from the description of the wound uh, to the uh, to the reaction and the complaint um, and the more explicitly pronounced uh, voice of, um, of the doctor, uh, where he starts complaining about, uh, where he starts talking about suddenly how the family is happy. Die Familie ist glücklich, sie sieht mich in Tätigkeit. Right, and I Which noticed when contrast. you read that, that, you did give a slight yeah. humorous yeah. chuckle, and there's a kind of onomatopoeia in those mm -hmm. words in German. Mm -hmm. They're chuckling words in German. Is that right? They said, you're looking at me like I'm yeah. completely mad. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> uh, do they have any kind of, I mean, there are some words, the sound of which is humorous in a language. Would that be true of those? No. No. Oh, yeah. well. <laughs> no they sound no. funny in English. <laughs> no, glücklich is a happy sound. Glücklich, yeah. Yeah, it's, well, it's sort a nice of, one. I mean, coming, yeah. all right, go on. Go but, on. but it's quite ironic. I mean, this, this contrast uh, with the, with the doctor finally finding the wound after he declared the patient to be um, mm. well, uh, to, and he, he finally finds the wound, and it's a horrific wound, and it's quite disgusting. Uh, and so uh, it, it's what, it, it, it flips over to this description of the family being happy because finally the doctor is doing his job, mm. and he's being active, and they, they see him doing what they called him to do. So the family doesn't seem to be particularly concerned that their little boy is, or their boy is... Um, um, lying in bed with a potentially fatal wound. Mm. They are concerned that the doctor does his job. So there is that ironic element there, and the, the whole description of um, how it's passed on, how they how they narrate it, how they talk mm. it to each other, how it's uh, reiterated, that makes it quite funny. And then, uh, I think, the description of, uh, this is like a spectacle, that, you know, mm. um, something's finally happening in this village, the guests are coming, and they are balancing on their tiptoes through the door, and they get told about this as well. Mm. That's weird. I, I can see all of that, and yeah. it strikes me when I hear you discuss it. I can see how it could be funny. But I venture to suggest that the problem is, is what we would call timing. That it doesn't work in English as a piece of comic timing, precisely because of the difficulties of Kafka's style. I mean, presumably, you know, because the Elysians it doesn't go ba boom boom ch in English. And there must be an element of ba boom boom ch in German. No? Not here. No. There must be an element of setting it up and then deflating it in some way, undercutting. The statement must undercut. No, you want it to be too broad. This is okay. that broad. Me uh, reading the German, yeah. this is, it's a, a little throwaway remark of the doctor's, which is out of tune with the horror yeah. surrounding the yeah. room. Yeah. Okay, so can we extract from it, in fact, a wry twist of the lip rather than a deep and throaty guffaw? <laughs> no, certainly not a deep guffaw. <laughs> no. Is a wry twist of the lip in, um, you know, it's the Prague Jewish German community of the 1920s yeah. very, very funny? Oh. I mean, I, I, again, I'm struggling to find. I mean, I know, obviously, the example I've 
drawn is mm. from the beginning of the trial, and we're not discussing that in particular. And maybe I haven't f chosen the particularly. I mean, one of the few passages in Kafka I can think of that made me get close to laughing is in the judgment where the father leaps up out of bed. Mm. Right, and I could see that that was a startling juxtaposition that was kind of funny in the context of the protagonist's neuroticism is trying to get the father to bed, is trying to vanquish the father, and the father, you know, rather like Kafka's own father, being in his such rude good health that he leaps up in bed and holds on to the ceiling. That's one of the few points in Kafka where I think I've gone, ha, like that, you know. <laughs> and that's not rolling around in the aisles laughing. Well, try to visualize it yes, and the, think in terms of a cartoon. Mm. And then it would be laugh out loud. And would, Richie Robinson and does say in your introduction. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Mm. No, I was just thinking, in the introductions, yeah. I think it's to Metamorphosis, but mm. it, he may have repeated yeah. it. He's written another introduction mm. for the new book. He says that Kafka is, his humor is like that of the silent film. And just as there are people who don't mm. get Buster Keaton or don't mm. fall about when they see mm. Chaplin, they're probably people who don't yeah. Yeah. see what Kafka is on about. And I think part of it has to do with the tenses yeah. that you're talking about, because when he removes the subjunctive that's so familiar, you get well away from metaphor. So you have Gregor Samsa waiting, mm. waking up, and he is an insect. He's not like an insect. He just has become one. And this happens repeatedly. And it's that the boy becomes mm -hmm. his wound, you know, which has been completely invisible mm -hmm. up until that point. So, so what are you saying? In German, happened. it feels more, more conditional and more metaphoric, and so it's, it's funnier or it's more I'm literal? I'm not sure I believe the metaphorical thing. I think um, if you look at Kafka's dream diaries, you know, what a dream does is remove the metaphor mm. so it becomes literal. Mm. Mm. So, you know, something inscribed in your flesh or making a mark on your body can turn into mm. the torture machine in the penal colony. Mm. It becomes absolutely, which it etches your sins on your back until you die. It writes it on you. Yeah. And it's imprinted on the flesh. And that's what a dream does. And that seems to me you almost have to reverse the whole thing out again and say, this isn't a metaphor. This is actually what he sees as happening. And that's why the narrative voice in Kafka is yeah. so extraordinarily unique. Yeah. And you get all these people as unlikely as, you know, mm. Auden and mm. Camus and uh, Borges, all saying that he is the writer of the 20th century who will always be remembered just as, you know, Goethe. Right, they're not Martin reading him in German either, are they? <laughs> no, almost certainly oh. not. But they are they laughing? Laughing? <laughs> Mm. I, thought, I, I took yeah. your first point more. When you say, uh, if we're thinking in terms of slap, slapstick and montage and juxtapositions, <laughs> as in silent films of the period, which he undoubtedly mm. would have seen, um, it's a gentle Chaplin-esque slapstick mm. in that sense, rather than a vigorous Keaton-esque mm. slapstick. Mm. Is that fair? But it's also yeah. satirical, because it's satirizing yeah. this doctor who's supposed, unlike the priest in this cassette, to come and heal all ills, you right. know, because And I get that man. in this passage as well. I can see, again, uh, this line uh, in Joyce's translation, this transition. Will you save me, whispers the young man, sobbing, quite blinded by the life inside his wound. Again, this intensely graphic image of the wound. And then the doctor follows on, that's how the people are in my region. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, that's... I can see the irony there and the, co the comedy working there, but is it more emphatic in German, that transition between the two, between the kind of, you know, incredible kind of painful uh, desordonne of the, of the young boy and the kind of, uh, you know, well, that's how the people are in, in my region. Does that resonate more in German than it might in English? I don't think so, but... In to me, there's a, there's a touch of the, the peasant attitude that, okay. which yeah. believed in touching for the king's evil, that mm. sort of thing. Mm. Mm. And, and the doctor's mm. remark, he's saying, you know, these carrot crunches, yes. that's what they're yes. like, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, which but he's he... also saying that the boy thought when the doctor first arrived that he, you know, and the doctor failed completely to see the boy mm. was wounded, mm. that he was going to let him die. So his mm. first, you know, fear was the doctor was going to let him die. And now he's got a moment of hope saying, oh, you're going to save me now. Mm. And it's extraordinarily prescient because on Kafka's own deathbed, 
he apparently told his doctors, his two doctors, it was written down at the time, yes, if yes. you don't kill me, you're a murderer. <laughs> yes, um, Captain Sears. And threw off the ice pack with which they were trying to soothe, you know. But isn't the irony there fever. more? I mean, I take the, the seer like Kafka thing with a pinch of salt, but isn't, this, isn't the irony more in, the, in, in, the, in a country doctor that the doctor the doctor's done his job when he's almost produced the wound himself. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a failing as a doctor when he arrives and fails to diagnose. And it's, that connects with the remarks about the old faith, you know, that they've lost their old faith. What they want out of medicine is not just medicine to be efficacious, but medicine almost to produce wounds so that they can be healed in that way. Anyway, I'm getting slightly off the point. Mm -hmm. I'm conscious there was a hand up over there, that it's time there to throw, be some roving mics yes. throw the discussion them. open mm -hmm. and welcome really any input, whether in the form of statements, questions, objections, dissensions, uh, that people may have to make on translating, translating from German, translating Kafka, and Kafka and humor. And thanks very much to the panel. Okay, there was a question. You, you've got the mic. It's, I think you've said it in the meantime, really. I just wanted to say that I did think Kafka was funny and that it is, it's pantomime and slapstick. And, and when you made the connection to um, early silent film, then that, that's what it is. It's, it's visual and it's not metaphorical, it's bodily, it's physical. Mm -hmm. And it, it's almost the sort of, the, and when you mention the, the scene with the father in the judgment, it's that, mm -hmm. it's that bodily okay. um, sort of engagement and, and, and physical moving around that's right. funny. And, and, and that, that's um, also with the doctor here, it's a sort of pantomime okay. incompetence. Are, the you the, are you the sort of person who laughs at pratfalls? <laughs> I laugh at Chaplin. Right, but I mean, if somebody trips over in front of you, do you laugh? Or if somebody, no, somebody no. what's taking a sip of a drink and misses their mouth and it goes down, <laughs> would you find that amusing? I mean, I'm not, I'm not making this, I think the world's divided into people who do and people, my wife finds these things hilarious. <laughs> and those sort of programs on the TV where families have videoed their children on their tricycles sort of falling over and banging their heads. No. Well, so no. <laughs> You're not that sort no, of person. No, I'm not saying that at all, but I think well. that's where the humour comes in this. It's the, it's the physical bodily pantomime. Mm. It's the incompetence of the doctor, mm. which is... Funny. Right. No, I only raised that because it would solve the whole enigma for me in one. Because <laughs> I don't find that sort of stuff remotely amusing from the start to the finish. I mean, that's it why you don't find this funny. Yeah, but yeah, well, that may well be it, yeah. If I may say, Will, um, I couldn't see what anybody was going on about the humour in Kafka. I, four years ago, I was with a bunch of translators of Julia Frank's German uh, novel. Uh, it's Dimitar's Frau in German. I dislike the English title so much I can't bring myself to say it. Not my choice. But, um, and I was listening to Julia's Eastern European translations all saying how funny, how funny Kafka is. And I thought to myself, well, poor things until 1989, they didn't have much to laugh about <laughs> if after it. And um, then I actually got down to the castle. I didn't let on to them that I was just beginning to the castle. And to my astonishment, it reminded me very strongly, not so much of Alice in Wonderland as Alice through the looking glass. Um, the landlady of what in my version I called the Bridge Inn, Gardena, she is a dead ringer for the Red Queen. She is practically shouting off with her head to everybody who offends her. And, and I could see that it, there is absurdity, not absurd. which is, which is mm. not, not so far from the pratfall, I suppose. Mm. 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 He shifts registers so rapidly. He does, doesn't yes. he? Yes. So that uh, there's a moment's anticlimax. Or um, when, yes, the, you laugh or, or no, no, not out loud. Uh, or contrary ones, of course, you will have a sudden moment of exalted speech. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, oh, is this going to be significant? Mm -hmm. And you're never quite sure. Mm -hmm. he, he, he just keeps you uncertain. Mm -hmm. But apropos slapstick, I do recommend Bloomfeld and Elderly Bachelor. Uh, which I think is, is yes, sheer um, Chaplin-esque comedy. Uh, 
uh, it, and visualize it as you're going along. I won't say any more about it. I leave the pleasure to you. And uh, if I can hold forth a moment, because it came as a complete surprise to me when I was translating the story, a little woman told by, I would say, a rejected suitor retrospectively on the whole relationship. And it begins as there's a little woman who is always annoyed at me. And so it goes on. And for once, I think it's for once, this focusing on the single narrow point of view, and believe me, it's tunnel vision, uh, means by the end you can see absolutely why that little woman is annoyed at him and why, she, <laughs> and why finally it's going to end in a, in a party. Um, I, I do remember uh, there was a passage in it, I wasn't sure how to, I didn't understand it, took it to a German-speaking friend of mine and said, can you unpack this for me? And she looked at it and she smiled and I picked up her smile and by the end we were both of us roaring with laughter at it. And truly, truly, it may be just a woman's way of reading this exceedingly self-centered man's account of, well, those two shouldn't have been seeing each other. Um, and I must say, I find it very, very funny and wholly unexpected. Again, recommended. Um, I'm only really talking about metamorphosis when I describe this, but it seems to me that in that story, which I was rereading recently in the Muir's version, um, what can be funny is precisely the earnestness of it. Um, as long as there's, as long as the background scenario to that, if you like, um, ironizes it. But once you've set up that situation, I think you can refer to it, you can bounce off it any number of times, and it's funny. Um, there's a moment before the pin has dropped for Gregor where he's charging around the house with all his little legs saying that the chief clerk can't possibly be allowed to leave before I've made my explanations, otherwise it'll endanger my position at the firm. Mm. Um, and he's a sort of giant bug, feeling terribly worried about his position at the firm. So he hasn't caught up with where we are. And to me, that's very funny, because he's a very worried giant bug. <laughs> <laughs> I find Metamorphosis, which I also reread in that translation quite recently, and have reread in other translations, so grindingly horrible and disturbing <laughs> that I question your sanity, young man. <laughs> <laughs> because for me, and I was thinking about this, the, 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 and what struck me about Metamorphosis when I first read it, and maybe again, I'm missing something completely, or maybe, dare I raise the, the awful specter that it's in some sense, for this reader at any rate, untranslatable. Because it relates to what you say you, you think I was funny about it. To me, the most horrible thing about metamorphosis, and this relates to, again, to movement, and the relationship in Kafka always between posture of the individual, gesture of the individual, and the movement of the individual through space, which he constantly writes about. He's constantly moving his characters around, much more so than, relative to a lot of other writers, are totally static with their characters. They'll say, basically, they put their character in a chair and they stay there, sort of saying things for a while, and then they'll put them to bed. So I do that quite a lot. I'm probably guilty of it a great deal. But Kafka's characters are constantly in an interplay between gesture. And where this becomes horrible in metamorphosis is you think, because it's so well described, the practical problems of being an enormous, verminous, uh, probably insectoid creature, though I believe it's never actually defined. I suspect he's a bed bug, in fact. Um, Hoffman translates it as vermin, and I think it is vermin in the German, isn't it? It's yeah. not cockroach, it's not insect. Uh, interesting that it always does get translated away. Anyway, to get to my point, is if that, the predicament is that practical, it's that practical and bodily, then there should be a practical bodily solution to it. And why it's so tormenting to hear Gregor suffer in this way is you think, is you, you're with him. You think, yes, if only you could get your little legs to work together, or if only you could somehow figure out a way of doing this, or if only you could get the apple that's embedded in your back out of it, everything would be okay. And that's not funny. <laughs> 
No, but I think, I think maybe the, the central point is uh, with humor and with the funny is that there is a moment of the incongruous. And incongruity can be achieved in a number of different ways. Uh, and it can be that that a ching, mm. um, or it can be a sudden shift in register, or it can be built up through uh, repetition until you reach, um, it becomes funny because of that repetition. And I wonder whether that description of Gregor running around on his little legs, this, this sort of repetition and building up and building up uh, creates that incongruity, which then needs release through laughter. And I think maybe incongruous is our solution for Kafka's humor, because what we, what we perceive as incongruous may be, may be culturally specific because of um, what, what we consider as normal and, and not normal. Mm. Can you... I think we need other words from funny, yeah. uh, uh, absurd, grotesque. Uh, but we do have funny strange as well as funny ha ha, it and is, it is this is interplay all the time. Yeah. Um, we do have it in the one. But is there more of an inclination in the German-speaking world to laugh at funny peculiar than there is in the English-speaking world? I only draw one back again to the idea, not just of Kafka reading these stories aloud yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to his friends and then wryly smiling and occasionally letting out the odd you know, uh, kind of uh, e explosion of kind of uh, the darkness of this peculiarity, but actually laughing. Do we believe this? Or? Well, one account has him laughing hysterically at certain points when right, he reads hysterical. the trial aloud, and I think that's because it was his, yeah. you know, his own experience, and it was um, a response to the, this sort of fear that there was in the trial. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I think it's a bit... I always felt it was a bit of everything because I always thought that Kafka's sense of humour was quite cruel. And I always, I always thought that um, the bits in the text where I thought it was funny, it was kind of a laughter that stuck in my throat. Um, it was, it's part slapstick, but in such unexpected situations um, where you really don't expect to be laughing. And... Um, and I think that that always had a certain cruelty, and that's why I think it also makes sense that Kafka himself was laughing when he was reading the text out loud, because he was very aware of that, perhaps. Is it that he's allowed to laugh with it? He has permission or license to laugh at cruelties that he feels have been enacted on him? Is, is your, what is your native language? Please? German. German. So you're talking about, obviously, reading him in German and yeah. finding... Does, uh, but, I mean... I, I, again, from my, you know, sadly one-sided perception of German culture, German culture seems rich in irony uh, and, and many forms of irony. They don't seem to be, you know, just one kind of humor in Germany at all, but it seems as layered and preoccupied by the ironic as a culture as English language culture is. Would that be fair? It, it's there. It's different, mm. I think, than mm. in English. Can you characterize the difference? I mean... Irony in, in England often strikes me as strongly situational. It's strongly allied to class <coughs> discourses and to situations of, uh, you know, the classes being thrown into propinquity with one another, people, you know, people being in the know and people not being in the know. Uh, is that true of Germany, or are we talking about a different sort of sense of irony? And hurry up. You know, don't imagine we've got all night. <laughs> I abdicate. I refuse all kinds of essentialism. Oh, uh, okay. You've also already accused me of associative thinking, and I think yeah. so. No, that wasn't an accusation. That was a description. <laughs> I, I think um, the only thing I can say about that is my own experience. Uh, that partly of what I enjoy so much about English is that it allows you to make a joke out of everyday speech as you go along. So it's it's situationally tied. And uh, you, you, can, you can turn that into a little uh, comic remark, and it's, it's tied into, into discourse. Mm. And whenever I try to do that in Germany, when I go back and, and talk, it always falls flat. It just doesn't work. Um, and so that is one difference that I've noticed. So that's always the disjunct between, as it were, the dictionary meaning of the word and the demotic use of the word. You can play upon that all the time. You can reverse 
You, you can extract irony from a semantic disjunction in the spoken language the whole time. But you don't do that in German in the same way. Well, we mustn't forget that where <laughs> Kafka was, in one sense, mm. the demotic language was Czech. Mm. And he was a fluent Czech speaker, unusually insisted on speaking Czech. But there's this confusion where German was the language of mm. education, but also the language of the Jews in the region, which created, no doubt, huge inner conflicts as well as external conflicts mm. in the First World War when German speakers supported Germany against all the other leagues of nations. And then, of course, look what happened in the Second World War. So you've already got not so much a class system going on within the language, but different languages operating in different ways. Right. Does, does Kafka's um, German prose allude to that, though? I mean, I know, he's, you know he, he will reference yes. his name, for example, as a motif. But are there other resonances of the existence and of And, of this? course, his name was an invented name. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't But are Kafka. there other references within the text of, to this Czech strata? Well, I'm wondering about language. these peasants in the, right. you know, and the guy in the pigsty mm, and all the rest of it. I don't know. He, he'll use uh, a term that is uh, Austrian uh, or... Um, Bavarian. Uh, not necessarily Bavarian, I think, but, but Austro-Hungarian. Oh. rather than uh, German, you'll say sometimes plafond instead of ceiling or deck. Um, and when he puts language into the mouths of the father figures, that coarsens rather, and to that extent, I think it has a kind of speech melody that's not pure. Right, but it's not, he's not yeah. referencing Czech, necessarily. He not, would be referencing you know, maybe... Well, the, the, the kind of German spoken mm -hmm. by... Um, Austro-Hungarian officials. Uh, Austro-Hungarian provincials. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Up there? There's, a, there's a gentleman up there. He's got the mic. Yeah, there's just one other thing um, <laughs> that struck me as significant. You, the, the, the famous story about the, the, the friends falling about laughing. Um, they were actually listening to the, uh, to the works being read aloud. And I think that connects with something that you said at the very beginning of the discussion about, um, about trying to mimic. And the, the, there's a, a question of voice here as well, which is, is very important to the humor. And, and perhaps, perhaps very, very difficult. One of the, the most difficult translation tasks to actually capture the voice. Right, certainly the timbre and the enunciation and the, the extent to which he would have modulated it in reading. But I can't help but feeling it's timing, surely. There must be an element in, in the timing with which the phrases are uttered that must create uh, humour in some way that I'm missing. Well, I think there is in that line that Karen picked up um, just before which the extract finishes. And there is timing in, in the phrasing there. It's different from what went before, isn't it, Karen? Um, the, one, the, the one just after? Yes. Yes, well, yeah, I, I, I was thinking that um, in that last paragraph where we were talking about um, that shift over to, to the doctor complaining how they demand the yes, impossible, yes. it's that sort of... Um, country voice almost, we talked about it. That, that goes on and it actually builds. Um, and the, the next two lines, he, he goes on com complaining and, and putting forward in the German, it is, nun wie es beliebt. And that's this really quite fussy, but also pompous, impersonal way of saying, well, if you demand this of me, then of mm. course I'll do whatever. And, and it, so the phrase, goes on and builds and becomes more annoyed and and that that is I think timing in terms of building up mm -hmm. okay we've got some more hands up um. hi so I, I've got a question about um, translation in a slightly different sense um, by which I mean the reception of Kafka by English novelists in the 1930s. And um, I suppose there are two parts to the question. One is a, an interest which I uh, 
have in, in asking Will whether or not he's uh, read people like Edward Upward and Rex Warner who were um, using Kafka, uh, kind of certain elements of Kafka, in a, I think, in an interesting way in the 1930s, as that would seem to me to be some kind of uh, missing link in the literary history which might, might go from, from Kafka to your own work. And the other part of the question is to ask the panel <clears throat> what, what they think about um, the importance of this legacy and, and um, the, the extent of it and, and, and its importance. Okay, well, I can be brief, no. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not familiar with their work. Uh, no. That, that was a good answer, I feel. I think that really covered it. So I can hand it back to... I think I could say something there because I did have a look at them in the light of uh, Edwin Muir's introductions to his translations. He constantly refers to Kafka, Kafka's novels uh, in terms of what he calls good allegory, uh, picking up from Max Brod's introductions. And I think that's the dimension which is... is Force is a kind of consistency of reading on the novels that I don't think they bear. But that is the reading, Kafka, novel writer, allegory, that I think the young men of the left picked up. And that's what you find there much more than I think you would in Will's writing. Yeah, I, mean, mm. I mean, quite specifically, actually, I mean, the interesting thing about the, the introduction to the castle is that mm. it makes the link to Bunny. And yeah, and you see, and, and that carries you that much fact, further. Mm. If he's writing a novel, yeah. so different, not just obviously the Muir's translations, but you have access to it, it's actually Edwin Muir's telling him how to write Kafka. Translation, uh, yeah, right. introductions, yes. But I mean, yes. Max, I'm not pronouncing it right, am I? How do you pronounce Broad? Which is pronounced oh, broad. broad, Max mm. Broad. Mm wants it both ways. He wants both to dismiss the idea that Kafka is an allegorist, and of course that's probably because Kafka's told him flat out personally that he's not, but he also wants to reclaim him for allegory and to his own uh, mm. essentially Zionist uh, program at the same time. So, you know, Muir, Muir's doing the same sort of thing in a way, isn't he, but more programmatically for... Yes, but well, without the Zionist dimension. And again, uh, as an early translator, looking for a familiar model and finding it in Bunyan. Mm -hmm. you know, the reverse of Bunyan, how difficult it is to be the modern pilgrim. There was well, one the search for God in, uh, um, in interpretation comes in there. Mm -hmm. There was one, I'm sure you know, one famous reader who, of course, was not impressed by all this allegory and everything else, and Thomas Mann gave Albert Einstein a Kafka novel, and Einstein handed it back to him a couple of days later and said, the human mind really isn't that complicated. <laughs> Which, from Einstein, I thought was a bit rich. But anyway, yeah. I mean, yes, <laughs> of course, because it's, it's not realistic. It's not meant to be. I had a very patrician tutor at university, German tutor at university, who was, uh, after the war, going to Nuremberg. Um, and he was, of course, an officer. And he was uh, sitting on a train opposite a British squaddy. And the squaddy brought a book out of his bag. Already, my tutor was a bit shocked. And the book was Teach Yourself Czech. And he took him probably up to Cologne to say to the guy, why, 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 do you, why, why do you want to read Czech? Why are you learning Czech? He said, because I want to learn, I want to read Kafka in the original. And my, my tutor then spent most of the journey thinking, do I tell him that he might read a few letters, but actually he can't. And he opted not to read, to tell him that Kafka actually wasn't written in Czech, Kafka was written in German. Why? Uh, because I suppose he didn't want to burst his illusions, and he found it very difficult to believe that anyone could see this as being, uh, he, he was, he was That's the funniest over. thing I've heard all night. <laughs> but isn't that, well, In a dark isn't that sort of Kafka? Isn't that, isn't that precisely the, the passage no. that you chose about the boy thinking the doctor is the one person who's going to save him and the one person who's actually not going to be able to save him is in fact the doctor? Isn't that the Kafka situation? That it is indeed incongruity. That the letter to the father is the one person you want love from, is the one person you're never going to get love from. No, or I the think that's, artist. A, that's a nasty English class joke. No, <laughs> I think we it see it as a nasty English class joke, but I think other people see it as someone who actually... <laughs> <laughs>
Um, no, I think it's patronizing. He has of your, you've characterized your tutor as patrician. And uh, he's being, he was being deeply patronizing to imagine mm -hmm. that it would burst the young but man's is also, bubble. It it would, is also you wouldn't do it to a peer. You would not say, if you saw your peer making mm -hmm. that egregious an error, you would help them out of it. Yeah, but we all laughed. And that's, yeah, we that's laughed the Kafka at, laugh, isn't we, it? I think, that's no, we were Kafka laughing laugh. at class, class condescension, mm -hmm. would be yeah, my it, argument. It was rather a cruel laugh. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't that what the Kafka laugh is, a cruel laugh? Isn't the hunger artist or the letter to your father a cruel laugh? Well, I had no inhibitions when I, a few years ago, I was on a TV panel, um, a program uh, before the book on B B BBC yeah. Four, and the producer, Peter Kessler, who is a friend of mine, said, would I be one of the panelists for the year? It was um, the year of first publication of The Trial and various mm -hmm. other books. And I said, I thought somebody ought to back the trial who not only could read it in German but had read it in German and it was a great surprise to my friend Peter the producer that it was in German he assumed it was in Czech I had no hesitation in telling him and what's more I was rather pleased we got um, the trial it was never going to win in that year against the great Gatsby but it came, I got it up to second <laughs> okay, but can we just backtrack on this for a minute, because it is fascinating, and Amanda really raised it, and I should have raised it earlier. And I, you, you, both of you, Joyce and Anthea, have to have, must have more to say about this. The particular status of being in a little island of German speakers, cut off even from the rest of the Sudeten Germans on, on the border, this little sort of isolated kind of lager of German speakers in Prague. Um, does that not add something to Kafka's German? Does it not add something that we've taught? Here we have a country doctor, but it, presumably, actually, if the country, the country doctor wasn't inspired by Zurau, which is in Siren, which is in Bohemia, what's going on there? What is really going on there? What are other people in Kafka other than the protagonists speaking? What are the country people speaking? Is there some registering in the German original of this other language community encircling them? I don't find it. Not no. in the language. No. Kafka himself, very self-critical, always talks it, uh, refers to it as ein Papiernis Deutsch. Right. His so own uh, papery, uh, um, a literary German. But is that a dissatisfaction with his own style? Because he's yes. perpetually yeah. annoyed. Yeah. And, and what, yeah. what I think uh, you said, either you or Anthony said, was his, his kind of, and you find it in a lot of the notebooks, is a kind of rage both at language's imprecision and its precision. Mm -hmm. You know, he's always, you feel he's always feeling that language either takes him too far or not far hence, enough. Hence, perhaps, all those qualifiers that mm. Joyce was mm. mentioning, the practically, the positively, the almost, the nuances. And the, the literally. Yeah. And the irritation uh, the, with, with his own mm. literallys. Anybody else in, in the audience? Kafka was a dispossessed person in a way in terms of language. I'm wondering whether it's possible to convey that in any translation, that sense of his, of him thinking in one language perhaps and writing and speaking in another, whether that, that sense could be, can be conveyed in a translation. Well, he thought in German. Joyce, I mean, uh, he, he thought in it German. Was, it was the educated language where he was yes, living. Yes, he talked in German. I, 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 um, this is his language. Um, I understood Czech he taught himself Czech. Czech is what he learned. Yeah. Czech, uh, I, I think if you read the diaries and the, the letters, you, you, something much clearer comes out, uh, simply from the life he was leading. Uh, in his fa Helping in his father's shop, the assistants were Czech. And Kafka, out of the deep civility, uh, he learns Czech to get on with them. Similarly, in his grown-up job, uh, he, as um, an insurance adjuster, he is meeting uh, people who've been damaged in accidents. They are the Czech workmen. He <laughs> talks Czech to them. But it was learnt. It was acquired. It didn't come naturally. It is. His father's Yiddish had 
Right. Uh, his father simply didn't speak Yiddish any longer. But had uh, done as a young man. Done. And yeah. but mm -hmm. isn't it a strange situation? Because as I understand it, Czech itself was a debatable tongue in the sense that uh, under the influence of uh, the absorption into the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Czech itself had, had needed to be revived in the 19th century uh, yeah, and, and had was, been it's, under it's threat very, as very a language. Strong. It, 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 by, by the time Kafka was on the scene, it was very strong. Yes, and but as part of... of nationalism. Uh, and indeed, it was in a reciprocal relationship yeah. with the nationalism. But prior to that, and not mm. so long before, mm. it had been a dwindling tongue. So what we have is a picture of a very contested yeah. linguistic area, uh, indeed. It was uh, only with the foundation mm -hmm. of Czechoslovakia at the end of the First World War. Mm -hmm. Czech nationalism was on the rise, which Kafka supported, and the Czech language mm -hmm. was more widely disseminated. And he actually chose to work. I mean, most Jews worked in Jewish businesses. That was the easiest way mm -hmm. to operate and spoke German and all the rest of it. But he chose to work in this... Um, industrial compensation or claims, mm. insurance mm. claims building, um, where he was one of only two Jews on a quota working. So his mm. colleagues would have spoken French, uh, French Czech there anyway. Mm. So he was putting mm. himself in a Czech milieu. Right, and when he time. was in the office speaking, yeah. then he would have spoken Czech. Yeah. Just going back very quickly to um, something that Anthea said earlier on about um, perhaps a sort of responsibility to the reader and responsibility to the writer um, when, when, when translating. Um, and, and how, and we talked about sort of voice, if you like, or kind of music, things that we, we hear, and perhaps sort of a, a space of, of nothingness, of no language, before sort of a transformation into, into the other language, um, which I find fascinating and perhaps can relate to a lot more than um, uh, some of the ideas in, in for, for example, in Benjamin or in, in Bartes even. And I was wondering how you felt about that. Certainly in my reading of, of, of um, the task of the translator, um, the, the, the sort of the reader seems to fall away. And equally, the, the writer seems to fall away. We're probably closer to some sort of Bartesian um, idea of the intention of the, the text. How, could you uh, discuss? Basically, um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's something that I'm trying to trying to get my head around in, in, in reading that and, and um, reading um, also metamorphoses in, in, in uh, German and in English. And by the way, I'm with my friend over there, and I think it's hilarious. Um, the first few bits, um, that sort of that sort of conflict. I think Benjamin comes across to me as a lot more of a theorist. And then we, when, when I've read what practitioners and what I've heard what you've just now said, um, doesn't seem to quite work in practice. Well, you, you started off with my point. Um, it is very difficult for a translator herself or himself to say how successful he or she has been. Mm. Uh, it's up to the reader. And, um, and it is a great gift to have good editors. I've been a little rude about copy editors sometimes because every now and then I get the feeling that they think, oh, well, this woman may know the language she's translating from, but she needs me with my shiny new degree in English to put her right. And then they go and put me wrong quite often. Uh, so they're mixing up uh, the verb to lie, as in to lie down, and the verb to lay. You do not lay down yourself. And you wouldn't believe how many people get this all mixed up. My son writes a column in the Times entitled The Pedants and all the stuff he complains about. I agree with him entirely. But copy editors will commit to these things. But um, if you get a really good copy editor, mm -hmm. oh, they're worth their weight in gold. Mm -hmm. Penguin have a wonderful one. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she's in-house or freelance, no, but no, she's a wonderful know. one. That's all well and good, but you're meant to be discussing the extent to which I guess the, the, what, verges on... But the, the, re the reader is very much too. alive for you, and you're thinking of the writer, and you are thinking of the reader when you're, when you're translating. Well, it's the text is what we have in common, isn't mm -hmm. it? And we are, in fact, substituting one text for another. Mm -hmm. 
and we have to deal with the encounter between the two texts. We're mediating. We're That's mediating. We're, we're mediating. I, I, I mean, from, from my pen, Benjamin, in his essay, not definitely question. believes that the text's voice is the one mm -hmm. that should be heard and is not interested, certainly, in the reader uh, at all. Uh, I mean, he says explicitly that he's not interested in the reader or indeed the, the as it were, recipient of any. What he's looking for is some kind of great tintinabulation of the aesthetic spheres that, that carries on ringing down the ages. He says that it would not... He, he says that the, the aim of, of good translation is to create something that uh, would be heard perfectly even if there were no one to hear it. The, the, the situation is not dependent upon whether or not anybody registers it. Uh, and and he's, he's talking, and actually coming out of a German philological tradition, he's particularly interested in the evolution, as it were, the natural and organic evolution of language in its own terms. So he tends to view language as being an organism in that way, doesn't he? Which is, so I don't know, that's my, my take on it. Thank you. If you don't care about the reader, um, you're, you're not going to translate any books because nobody is going to want to ask. Right, but he's, try, he's trying to rescue you as translators from what he calls, with a marvellous word which I hadn't heard before, uh, uh, the idea that it is somehow banaustic to be a translator. In other words, artisanal in some sense. So he's trying to rescue you from your sense of being... I don't object to that. No, we're, right. we're, we're craftsmen, the authors of the arts. Well, no, but he's, he wants to tell you that you're not craftsmen, that in fact you're philosophers. That's, what it, that's, it, that's the aim of his essay, is to establish translation as being on a par. And of course, I think he was a professional translator himself. So. You know, obviously he was bigging it up for the Benjamin Posse, <laughs> as we might say in contemporary demotic language. And the other just part of your question, just very <laughs> briefly, was on Roland Barthes, I think. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he's written the shortest and the densest essay there is on Kafka, including his language and his translation. Mm -hmm. But at least he ends by quoting Kafka. And he quotes Kafka saying, in the duel between you and the world, always back the world, which kind of puts pay to everything we've just said about finding the narrative voice and synchronizing it into the target language because it contradicts it completely. There's a gentleman here. It's, my question is actually uh, linked to what you've just been saying, and um, it's a question to the translators. Um, given what we've spoken about with Benjamin and the, and the echo and trying to, it sounds like you're trying to create the perfect, to move as closely as you can towards what is, could be the perfect translation of a, of a text. but. But stepping back from that and looking at perhaps the, the constrictions of German versus English or vice versa, have you ever felt in your translation you've created a more perfect phrase or a more funny, a funnier phrase or a, or a, you know, a phrase that, that, that has surpassed the language of the original author because English has a better way of expressing that, that idea? And, and if that has happened, have you... <laughs> Have you chosen your second best to equal the author of that <laughs> I don't think you can improve on the original. No. It would be a pretty poor original if you could. Well, it would be a pretty poor translation, too. Yes. Well, then that may just be a function of the caliber of the, of the works that you translate. Yeah. I mean, surely it's perfectly possible to imagine, you know, again, back to Benjamin, he, makes it, he says that precisely the books in which it's possible to translate them informationally with exactitude are not really worthy of translation. You know, so it's... But, but sort of linking to the humor side, you were saying certain things aren't funny, but sometimes you might translate a sentence and find it hilariously funny in English and have to pull the humor back. That's sort of the... This is a very well, risky field indeed. Yeah. Um, about three years ago at the Oxford Weidenfeld Prize, <coughs> which was won that year by Sasha Stanisic's um, How the Soldier Repairs the Gramophone, which is a book with a very strong, about the Bosnian War, but with a very strong strand of humour. And also shortlisted, there was a, a Czech book translated by a young Czech-born man, and it was very good. I listened to his reading, and I said to him afterwards, that was marvellous, funny is difficult, isn't it? And he said very, very truthfully, um, Yes, you're wondering all the while, have I gone too far? Have I tipped over into being facetious? And he did it very, very well. I would uh, um, also add an anecdote there of uh, a friend of mine who years ago had the 
had the task of translating the memoirs of Queen Juliana of the Netherlands into English. Laugh out loud stuff, I'd imagine. <laughs> it wasn't a matter of jokes, but of the utter banal simplicity of the good lady's observations on life. And he said, I can't do this. <laughs> But I think he did, because <laughs> he was quite good. But um, it, it, there, I think he did her rather well. well perhaps on, on that, did proud. that rather regal <laughs> note, I think we may have to uh, close. Um, I think, yes. We, well, close. We can migrate just outside. We can where migrate. I there's going to be some wine, and there can be further conversation, and so on and so forth. But first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming, to thank colleagues at City, including Karen, who's put a lot of work into this evening as well, and Sophie Cubbin and Spencer Bell, who arranged everything you see around you, all the technical stuff, the room, and all the rest of it, to professors uh, Steve Cottrell, head of school, and uh, Howard Tumba, uh, who's our dean, for letting us host this whole event. And, of course, to our translators, who not only have in common that they translate Kafka, but they also happen, each of them, quite coincidentally, to be translators of Freud and of uh, the Brothers Grimm, um, which seems, again, to be very much encapsulated within what we've been talking about to do with Kafka and fairy tales and the subconscious. And I really do think that in response to the question about... Uh, improving on the original and humor. Um, Anthea was too modest. I tried to persuade yes. her to say something about translating Asterix, and she wouldn't. <laughs> but honestly, anyone who gets the dog into dogmatics, I think, has done brilliant. it very yes. well indeed. And of course, thank you to, to Will, who's also been over modest, who not only invented a whole language in the Book of Dave, uh, to prove his linguistic interests and credentials, but has also written just a few introductions here and there to, to books by the Russians, Mikhail Bukakov and Yevgeny Zanyatin, and also to books by Georges Bataille and Fanon Céline, among others. So we're delighted uh, to have this multinational cosmopolitan <laughs> discussion between all of us here. We have to leave the room now, but do let's continue it outside. Thank you for coming. Thank you.